Okay, let's go then. Good morning and welcome everyone for today's lecture. Sorry about the mix up with the Zoom link. You're now in the right uh, uh, lecture. So, um, as always, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and, and just ask your question, or you can post them in the chat and we will uh, then uh, tell Vittorio what you asked. And without further ado, let's hand over to Vittorio um, and we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now I want to start with something uh, I think quite interesting. So, uh, we learned a few things and we Gain some intuition on about optomechanics, how to do calculation. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, so how uh, when I do a measurement, I have to take into account the added noise. We um, uh, we uh, study. We learn about input output the theory. We learn how to uh, describe the mechanical oscillator when it's coupled to cavity. And now I want basically my goal is like to put everything together to explain you know, how a much complex, a more complex uh, uh, like automechanical device works. And in particular, I'm interested in, as I already uh, mentioned in my introduction, so to this very nice application that would be very useful for quantum computing, uh, where uh, the goal is to have a device. Uh, where you can inject microwave photons uh, that uh, could come from a, a device based on superconducting uh, circuits and so also including the qubit, uh, qubit and that uh, uh, they exploit the Johnson linearity and then convert this microwave photon to an optical photon that can be sent out uh, via uh, an optical fiber to a very long distance, maybe in space you can imagine. Okay, and so you need this wavelength converter, and uh, this is an this is an implementation of the, this wave uh, length converter. So it does not yet work at the level of a single quanta. I will explain you why uh, later on. Uh, but so the idea is uh, the following: so you have an, an optical resonator. In this case, it's a Fabry pero cavity, um, like with this two mirror. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, there is um, inside of the, these two mirror are, are fixed, so, so they are not uh, the moving mirror. The mo moving mirror or uh, uh, the moving oscillator is in the mid, so it's somewhere inside of the cavity here. Uh, and um, there is a plate that is coupled. Uh, both to the um, to that it's moving inside of the cavity, and so it's going to uh, to be optomechanically coupled with the cavity, but it's also like ch changing a cap a capacitance in a superconducting circuit, and so it has a coupling both to a microwave uh, cavity, so to say, and, and an optical cavity. Okay, so my goal is to understand how this device works um, and. Uh, I go back to my notes. Uh, and for this, I first want to do a quick recap of what I explained before, because it will be needed. Um, so the first thing that we, we discussed uh, is um, uh, so uh, input output theory and the first example we consider was like a cavity with two ports. Right. And there was radiation coming from one port here that could be either reflected uh, Uh, or going to the cavity, and then this A output uh, is the sum of what is reflected and what comes out of the cavity. But we have a second port where also I have radiation coming in from a different heat path, and uh, it's coming out here. Maybe let's call it one in and one out in uh, A1. 
And so both uh, port are describing by a coupling, uh, uh, by a decay rate. So the rate at which the excitation from the cavity decay into the port and the temperature, right? Let's call them K1 and K2. And okay, they could be also fun of temperature we discuss. Uh, so the interesting thing, uh, the first thing that we learned is that there was uh, um, this interesting impedance matching condition. So when K1 uh, is equal to K2, um, so this is called impedance matching, we have the following uh, special situation that if I inject Uh, that if I inject something into the cavity from one port, it's going to, it's, and it's uh, in the resonant frequency of the cavity, uh, it's going to come out or out here, yeah. and vice versa. So if I did inject from here, it would come out here. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe I think that I haven't met, mentioned. So the underlying thing is that there is, the underlying mathematics is that there is a, a matrix that connects the input field to the output field. and and this matrix is a unitary matrix. Okay, um, anyway, so, and then, so this was uh, useful for optomechanics because in optomechanics we had, ah, and then I wanted to mention, so this was uh, like the toy model that we had in mind, but basically all the mathematics works uh, uh, if I have any uh, quantum system, in particular any oscillator coupled to a bus, so I can think of a more, uh, abstract representation of this situation. Okay. And uh, uh, okay, and then the next step was to see how this is useful to in an optomechanical setting. And we consider that it is the standard optomechanical setup with uh, a cavity, which has a moving mirror. So this would be the moving uh, And then in this situation, um, I uh, also kind of have two ports in the simple setting in the sense that I have photons that come in the cavity and that also go out of the cavity, uh, but I can uh, also have that uh, uh, basically the light is converted into vibration and then this radiation uh, radiates in a heat bath, and so I kind of have some also an output port here yeah, that I cannot access, so I will not be able to read uh, what is the thermal vibration that radiates uh, into my into the additional mode that I have in my cantilever, but it's there and I can calculate mathematically what happens to it. Okay, and then we have seen that, uh, so a particularly simple and interesting situation. Uh, is if I'm the so-called sideband result uh, limit. Um, well, I, I need that the mechanical frequency is much larger than the K rate into the cavity. Uh, so basically, in this case, the port, the, what was playing the role. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, this is from me, I should uh, not say this one. Okay, let's say I have this, and then uh, and the, the other important condition is that, uh, so this is the condition for the rotating wave approximation. If uh, I have this, and also I'm driving, um, uh, let's say that this is my character resonance, and my driving is here. And I'm driving exactly the right side band. So the distance from here to here is my mechanical frequency. And I have this condition, I can uh, only consider the term uh, in the optim linearized optomechanical Hamiltonian that conserves the particle number. So of the form A delta B. Right. Uh, and then I also uh, consider uh, to simplify even more the situation, I consider also the situation where both the optical, uh, okay, this is always with field, and, but it's important this, that the 
mechanical decay rate, let's call it intensive, uh, and the uh, opto linearized optomechanical coupling uh, are much smaller than kappa. Okay? In this case, I can really view my, my cavity as a neat bath and I can integrate it out. And so, uh, and then I arrive to a situation that it's analogous to this one, but where now the role of the cavity is played by the mechanical oscillator. Uh, and uh, I have that basically this is connected to two poles. So what is coming in uh, are the basically the quantum fluctuation from the light field. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the fluctuation, the thermal fluctuation from the heat graph. So these are my two ports. And uh, we have shown that uh, um, uh, the coupling, uh, okay, yeah, it's here. It's like as if nothing changes, so it's K intrinsic. Whereas here, after we uh, integrate out the cavity, we have found that there is an intrinsic damping sorry, an optical induced damping, uh, which is given by the following formula for G squared divided by uh, kappa, okay? Um, which means that, uh, so I explained basically this is equivalent to this. And so in this case, my with K gamma optical play, playing the role of K1 and gamma intrinsic play the role of K2. So uh, I have my impedance matching uh, when uh, gamma optical. And in this case, I have this following interesting situation uh, that um, so if I translate, uh, okay, now I'm uh, I'm really drawing my okay. Actually, I want. To so this thing, so it's, it's always my cavity, it's the original cavity. And if I consider uh, what happens if I'm shining light in it, uh, basically this uh, light enters in my, in my effective description. Uh, I see that this light, basically, is, there is no reflection, this is the impedance motion. It's all uh, transmitted as uh, radiation, so it enters the uh, it's dissipated into the mechanical resonator. Basically. And so I have this funny situation that uh, I started with a very good mirror. So the reflection was basically perfect. Uh, so there is just a tiny bit that enters because otherwise I would not be able to, to, um, uh, to, to, to drive the, the cavity. Uh, but then suddenly because of the optomechanical interaction, uh, I do not reflect anything anymore. So everything is absorbed inside. And this is what is called automatic content uh, transparency. Okay, uh, so this was uh, one situation that was interesting. And then the other situation that was interesting uh, when gamma optical is equal to gamma E, the other situation that it's also really interesting is when I uh, add that gamma optical, uh, becomes much larger than gamma. Okay. And in this situation, uh, uh, basically I have, uh, um, so I, I go back to the situation that uh, uh, it's like I have a very asymmetric coupling and so basically most of the light, I don't have the transparency anymore. Most, most of the light will go out here now. Um, and uh, but it's interesting to cal to calculate what happens inside of the of the cavity. So this was something that I explained uh, yesterday. So the cavity to be able to enter uh, the, the laser light to be able to enter the cavity um, as to absorb the photon. Right, this is the. And then it's shifting into the cavity. And so this will cause some cooling. And so if we use the input up, indeed, if we use the input output formalism to calculate the number of photons in the cavity, uh, we found the following formula uh, that 
um, the um, basically it's given by the simple formula. It's uh, I have the mechanically intrinsic decay rate, so the cut into the hot bar time uh, the number of circulating photon in the hot bar. Uh, but then uh, uh, I divide by the overall decay rate, which is uh, uh, gamma is equal to gamma n uh, plus gamma hot. So actually, this formula is valid in general, even if I don't have this condition. Um, and then if I have this condition, I find that uh, uh, this can be simplified as gamma uh, optical, which is equal uh, the number of thermal photon divided by the cooperativity. This cooperativity is uh, the quantity uh, uh, g square uh, divided by four g square divided by alpha uh, gamma intrinsic. Is and so it's a very uh, important uh, measure of the interaction strengths in, in an optomechanical system. And for instance, the I have this impedance matching when the cooperativity is one. I reach the standard quantum limit when this cooperativity is one. And in this case, I have cooling. Um, uh, I, I start to have really good cooling. I start to reduce my uh, uh, photon number uh, when the cooperativity is, um, uh, yeah, becomes larger than one. And, and I have a strong cooling in the interior that last cooperative. Okay, uh, so this, this was very cap. And now uh, let's see how this is connected to the situation that we wanted to, to consider. Uh, so, new page. On the new page. Uh, yeah, so now we want uh, again to consider the situation. I have, and so the goal is that. I would like to have that, a device that if I inject a microwave photon, uh, uh, it enters the black box and it comes out as an optical photon. And the simplest uh, setup that uh, does this trick is the following. So basically, uh, basically I'm, I'm drawing this more complicated device that we see at the very beginning in most schematic fashion. So I have a mechanical mode and it's coupled um, to two optical modes. Uh, this optical mode can have very different frequency like terahertz or microwave. Uh, let's say not mine. And uh, so then they will be both uh, uh, coupled to a different uh, uh, photon path. Uh, and uh, so typically I, I have access. So this is the radiation that leaks out of the cavity and that, that, that I can measure. And so in one case, it will be in the microwave and in the other case, it will be radiation in the terahertz region. Uh, of course, if when I really try to to build a device, a major uh, difficulties would be that some of the radiation get lost. But now I'm considering the and so the, the, I could describe this by adding yet another port in the input output theorem. But now I want to uh, start with a somewhat simplified uh, description. Um, and so I have the situation, and then also I have that the mechanical the mechanical oscillator can radiate. Uh, into the in, into the environment uh, with uh, with uh, it's that. Um, 
this is what is emitted and this is what is absorbed, uh, gamma time and time. Okay, and um, okay, yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, so this G represents the linear heights, optomechanical coupling, and I'm assuming that I'm driving both uh, the cavity to the red side, then so I have the following situation. Maybe I also draw it to make it more, more clear. Is there a question? Basically, uh, uh, here I'm drawing the frequency in the terahertz range, and I have uh, the uh, density uh, of space of the of this uh, cavity. Density of state of this cavity that is uh, basically um, broadened by the decay K2. So this is the, the width on my density of state, this is K2. And then I have a driving, uh, a laser driving this cavity. And the distance of the laser, the laser is that at the tune, and the distance from the cavity resonance is exactly the mechanical frequency and I do the same uh, trick in the microwave so now I am a very much more frequency in the microwave and I have here also a, a laser a Korean drive uh, so now it's k1 so it has it, it's going to have a very different width uh, and uh, but the important thing I choose the same detuning so the detuning is always the um, is always the mechanical frequency. Okay, and then uh, basically I, I consider the situation uh, so analogously as before. When I, so you see now I I can view this as uh, before I was viewing a, a mechanical mode coupled to an optical mode as uh, basically a mechanical mode coupled to a bath. Now the situation is not much more complicated, actually. I have the mechanical mode coupled to two different baths. And this is something that I can describe very easily with the input-output uh, theory, as I, I explained you. Uh, I just need to add uh, a decay rate and, a, and, a, 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 and an input field for each, uh, for each of the two baths and uh, um, uh, with the appropriate uh, decay rates. Right, uh, so it's important that I'm in the right uh, regime. So in this case, I need that uh, uh, gamma intrinsic uh, G1 and G2 are much less than the than the decay rate of the cavity, uh, and uh, that I'm in the side band resolve regime. And also, as I mentioned already before, I assume that I'm exactly at the red side band. Okay, and then I uh, carry the view as the mechanic to, to be a, like a cavity with three ports. So basically, the larger equation of motion will be something like this. Okay. 
And then, um, okay, where it's important. So uh, it applies what we said before. So I can really uh, treat every cavity separately. And so it's clear that the uh, optical decay, optical induced decay rate, uh, it's going to be in this formula. Okay, so I have, um, this is an I, right? So I have, in principle, two different, um, two different optical industry decay rate, one from the microwave cavity and the other from the optical cavity. Uh, and then, so uh, what uh, can I do now if my goal is to, uh, um, uh, to convert microwave into optics and optics into a microwave? Uh, well, I have to do my impedance matching, right? If I request that uh, gamma opt, I'm not sorry, first I have to say another thing. So yeah, it's slightly more complicated now because I have three ports, right? Uh, so it's not as easy as, uh, as at the beginning, but I can, uh, there is a limit where things become very simple if uh, uh, the intrinsic, um, the decay rate is much smaller than the two optical decay rate, right? Uh, then in this case, at least to first approximation, uh, I can say, okay, then I neglect completely my mechanical port uh, and uh, what happens with the other two ports. And then I go back to my scenario where, where I have uh, a mechanical copy, uh, cavity coupled to two poles. And this is the first thing that we learned how to deal with. Uh, and the idea is that if I want to have that oh, everything that is injected in one port goes out in the other port, uh, what I have to ask is that the two uh, K rate uh, are the same. So in this case, I have to ask that gamma optical one is equal to uh, gamma optical two. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, in principle, voila, I will obtain a, so a device that uh, uh, can convert a classical signal, signal coherently from uh, uh, from the microwave to the optics, and uh, also it's the other way around. So the thing, the process is reversible. Uh, the problem is that uh, that we this work at with, with with one photon, with a single photon, is this already enough? Uh, so um, I uh, at some point I told you that there is a catch in optical mechanics. If you want to do something quantum, you always need that. Uh, and term uh, divided by the cooperativity uh, is much smaller than one. Uh, so the, the cooperativity is much, because this is, uh, this is a very physical meaning, uh, basically the decay rate that you have induced, uh, uh, that, that you're optically induced in your mechanical uh, resonator uh, is larger than the rate at which photons entering the cavity from the from the off path. And so this it makes sense that something like this will enter. And how does it work here in this specific example? Well, the idea is that uh, now I was doing some kind of bleeding uh, order calculation in uh, basically, uh, actually my small parameter is uh, uh, square root of uh, gamma n divided by square root of k optical one. But if I consider, um, uh, the uh, if I consider what is the um, uh, is, sorry if if I want really to do at least calculate the leading order correction uh, I will uh, figure out that there is the problem that uh, uh, a little bit of what comes in from the mechanical but does go uh, into the optical part. Uh, but since, and then the problem, this is a problem if my uh, mechanical system is very hot, because then maybe I have a very small transmission, but 
I have a lot of photons, and then we this will add a lot of noise to my signal, and so this will not allow me to work with single photons anymore. So this is the rough idea. And then uh, if I want to have uh, an idea how many photons I will have in the mechanical cavity, also here I can use my intuition. So like, uh, so basically the idea is that here I can actually do exactly the same calculation that I did before. And I can calculate in the situation where I have two optical bath, uh, what is the number of uh, phonon in the cavity. Um, and then you remember here yeah, the formula was um, gamma interna times interna divided by the overall gamma, uh, which in this case uh, is going to be uh, the sum of uh the decay rate from the from both uh, and if i'm in this regime where uh, so in, in general it's like this but if i'm in, in the interested regime where this uh where basically the the optical decay rate completely overwhelmed the intrinsic mechanical decay rate i get the form the following formula so i can write this and then i just have and term uh, divided by C1 plus C2. And uh, so, uh, so you see, in order to have a, a very small number of uh, photons inside of the mechanical cavity, I need to have this, uh, that this quantum cooperativity is large. I will not do this, but if I calculate the added noise, uh, and uh, um, basically, I do the assumption that everything is perfect in the sense that I can really, uh, um, I can really measure all the radiation that it's emitting into the cavity, so nothing get get lost. Um, and um, I also assume that I have really that omega is. Uh, Basically, divided by kappa is infinity, so I have really, I'm very well sideband resolved. Uh, basically, the added noise will be indeed really given by this n thermal uh, divided by the so one half of this because this C1 and C2 are equal when I'm doing the impedance matching. Uh, and so, the, the added noise that comes from the fact that I have this noise coming from the n thermal, but it's really given by this formula. Okay, so this was the rough idea. Um, maybe I show also a couple of slides on this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to advertise some like pioneering experiments. Uh, so this Oscar Pinter group. Uh, uh, did it? You see, this is basically what I explained to you. So he did it with this kind of device. So an optomechanical uh, crystal. So yeah. Um, so there is an optical mode. Uh, so you you create a, a regular structure which has a, like uh, we support we support a band structure, uh, and uh, then basically you create a defect. So the 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 structure is not a, anymore quite translation invariance, and these uh, create uh, an optical mode uh, in the band gap of your uh, of, of your of your phot photonic crystal, and then this is coupled to the vibration of the beam in, in this case. And uh, what Oscar Painter did, uh, he consider uh, actually has even more than one mode in this case in the in the band gap and. He coupled these two modes, which has very different uh, frequency, but still in the terahertz, bo both in the optical regime, um, to uh, to the same mechanical mode, and basically use this scheme. Uh, and then, uh, uh, even more important, there are these, uh, uh, yeah, these uh, 
this uh, application, uh, th th there are this, this implementation in, in, from microwave to, to optics. Uh, and then yeah, the, they are really have reached uh, already the regime where uh, basically the, the optical uh, buff is in completely overwhelms the mechanical buff, but it, I think it's still, and I think they haven't yet demonstrated the single photon conversion. So this is technically very, very challenging. Uh, so because you really need to, to have a very well uh, uh, sideband resource system, both for the mechanics and the microwave, uh, you need uh, um, uh, not to have, um, uh, so you, it's important that you just, that you, uh, also that, as I mentioned before, that there is not, not intrinsic uh, loss in, in, in the opti optical part. So you have to make work a lot of things uh, to really uh, make it work with single photons. Um, okay, then uh, I want to explain something else and I go back here. That's, uh, Put myself on, on muted. Uh, okay. So I wanted to quickly explain what happens when, on the other hand, I'm driving on the. Uh, Or not, yeah, maybe so. Um, okay, let's. Uh, so, basically, I. Uh, uh, so, I wanted to discuss just one second more in close detail this formula. So, here I calculated this formula using the rotating wave approximation. Right, and the outcome is that. Uh, in principle, if, if I increase the coupling, uh, so if I can uh, arbitrarily increase the coupling, or I can uh, uh, cool the mechanical oscillator in some, for instance, I could have a microwave. Uh, um, so I, I, I could have a, a so some microwave vibration. Uh, uh, I have some microwave vibration, which is in in a, in a diluted fridge uh, uh, or in, in some very good fridge, and then the, this end term I will be not not so large, uh, and then this uh, really can allow me to have very small photon number. But then in that case, there will be something else that uh, uh, that um, uh, that limit my my cooling uh, and. Um, uh, so even though, so I at some point I will increase my coupling, but the the, the number of phonons the cavity will, will saturate, and uh, I wanted to explain this this phenomenon. Um, so maybe let's go to the page. Um, okay, so the idea here is that um, they came in the following situation. So now I. I depict it schematically. Again, so I have uh, my, my cavity resonance. Okay. Center of the frequency on the cavity. And I dive it with the laser. Now I want to consider somewhat more generic situation where uh, the distance between the laser and the cavity is not exactly the, the mechanical frequency, but I'm still driving. Actually, I, the formula that I will write will be valid for arbitrary detuning. Um, so, but yeah, let's say for the sake of cooling, I will be uh, at the red side band or close to the red side band if my goal is to achieve cooling. Um, but the formula will be general. Okay. And so the idea is that I explained yesterday that there are two processes that can occur in optical mechanics, right? Uh, there is this, uh, the one that comes from the beam splitting interaction, uh, where um, basically a photon, 
basically I absorb the, in the I have a laser photon uh, and in order to be able to enter in the cavity it absorbs a phonon and it creates a, uh, a, uh, and it creates a, uh, then a photon with frequency omega n minus omega. Okay. And um, basically, uh, what will be the rate of this of this process? And uh, and so, for instance, this process uh, will. Uh, um, so this is one of, of the processes. Okay, maybe I also say what is the other one. The other one uh, is when I have, I have a laser photon, and. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, it enters a cavity and at the same time it emits a phonon. Uh, so I'm sorry, maybe I should write also yeah, this, the frequency of the phonon was omega, and uh, the, the frequency of the photon will be omega uh, plus omega. Okay, and um, Okay, so no, let's push it. So yeah, it has a sort of photon. So yeah, the uh, the frequency is omega L plus omega, right? And yeah, it's uh, with the minus because it emits the photons. The energy should be conserved, obviously, right? Uh, okay, and uh, then I have to ask myself: so what is the rate of this uh, of these processes? So let's call it uh, gamma minus this one and gamma plus this. Um, okay. Imagine that I, uh, um, yeah. uh, I imagine that my uh, 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 photon is initially in the ground state, and I can ask myself, okay, maybe let's do it like this. Let's say that my photon. Um, my 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 cavity is it's in is in the one fox state, and as uh, I want to know what is the rate for going in the zero fox state, uh, call this uh, this rate I call it a minus, and uh, and then uh, the key. Maybe I, now I don't want to really calculate it, but I will give you an argument. So it's going to be to prop proportion. I mean, I, at the end, I have to do something like time equal the rule. So it should be proportional to the square of the interaction. So if I'm using the linearized Hamiltonian, so there will be this G squared, which is, I, I call it this G zero, the, the zero photon coupling times the number of photons squared divided times the number of circulating photon in the cavity. So this is inside the number of circulating photon in the cavity times basically the density of state of, of the optical mode, which is broadened basically by the, by the decay rate. And, um, and so this is something like the density of state of the cavity, uh, maybe something like this. Uh, Plus, and then the question at which frequency? Uh, well, at frequency omega L plus omega, and uh, we can I can also rewrite it as um, um, well, it's in principle is omega chi T minus. Um, and basically, so this is a Lorentzian center on the cavity. So if I want to uh, evaluate this in omega L plus omega, I need to have omega cavity minus uh, oops, minus omega L plus omega. No, sorry, minus omega L minus omega. Uh, which is also equal, um, um, 
and then squared. And then this is, you see, minus the detuning. Uh, so I can also write this thing as. Uh, Delta plus omega squared. Okay. And then uh, I consider A plus. Uh, then this is uh, induced by this type of process. And uh, it's uh, the, key, the rate if I am in the ground state to be excited in the first photon state. Um, and uh, this is also going to be proportional to. I mean, it's given by the same formula, just uh, it's from, by Fermi Gordon, it's going to be given by the same formula. Uh, it was only uh, to be evaluated uh, at, uh, instead of uh, before as at omega L plus omega, at omega L minus omega. And so at the end, I get uh, something like this minus delta plus omega. Uh, okay, so graphically, this is what I've drawn here, right? So here, the density of state, this, this is the density of state here. And then in a sideband resolve uh, the situation, the other process will be proportional to the density of state here. Do I have omega? I really have to go into the tail. And so here I have the tail of the Laurentian, but, and so, I, I still have absorption of, of, um, of, uh, uh, of excitation, so photon excitation, but it has much smaller rate that is basically it's suppressed by the density of the state. So this is the idea. Uh, and then, uh, so there are many ways to see it. Uh, the idea is that the, if I consider both processes, so now I'm not doing any rotating wave approximation anymore, the, the the decay rate is basically a minus minus a plus. So I can still uh, describe uh, uh, my cavity um, uh, as a thermal buff, but now effectively this cavity will have some finite temperature and also will have some uh, uh, decay rate, uh, which is which comes from both processes, not only one. So before I just had calculated this one. And uh, um, if I compare with the calculation that I've done before, uh, where basically I was not considering this A plus, uh, I can also see what is here the, the right, um, um, what is the right refactor. So, which is a two. So before I had calculated without considering this process that the uh, that the uh, optical induced decay rate was 4g squared uh, divided by kappa. And you see that I have the right dependence because uh, yeah, I have a k square and kappa square and here I have kappa. Uh, and uh, to get uh, the four correct, yeah, I, I have four year, yeah, but I need to, in order to, to get rid of this divided. And okay, so this is, was a little bit an heuristic explanation of, uh, of course, this will all come out if you do input up to uh, theory and you uh, still consider both uh, both terms. Um, and uh, okay, so this is my optical use the uh, decay rate. Uh, and uh, maybe I just wanted to mention that if you also do the the calculation of the number of thermal photons, you get something like this. So basically, it's like the same formula as before, uh, only there is this additional term with A plus divided by gamma. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically the idea is that you can view this as basically the, the, the photon absorption rate. Uh, so I, 
another way to see this is that a plus is uh, equal to uh, gamma optical, which I've already calculated, um, time and optical. So this is like some kind, if I would uh, uh, carry out my calculation with the input output theory, I will find that uh, the, the optical buff, if I consider both uh, side bands uh, as some effective uh, temperature and optical is an optical is given by this equation. And then that's why I, I, if I do the full calculation and I calculate the other B, I have that one. Okay, so this is uh, instructive because I see that there is a limit on how well I, I cool uh, if I'm not side band resolved. Uh, at least with this technique, there are other techniques to to uh, to cool. Um, but okay, now let's restrict to to this. Uh, this is called, by the way, sudden cooling. Um, and uh, but then I want you also to, uh, to, you to notice another thing. So this was a completely general formula. So it will will hold also if I have uh, my driving gear, for instance, in the blue side band. Uh, and now something funny happens. So you see, uh, if I'm if my driving is now here, something funny happened that um, uh, suddenly my uh, damping, my decay rate becomes negative because if I'm here, a plus uh, becomes larger than a minus, and this makes a lot of sense because uh, we have uh, seen that. This a, a plus come from a physical process where basically I'm adding all the time photon phonon pair, and then the idea is that the photon very quickly decay, but I start to accumulate all this phonon in the cavity, and so this should uh, give anti damping. And by the way, if I'm at a resonance, then uh, let's say that now I'm again I'm considering again omega uh, much larger than kappa. And I consider uh, that now I'm at, this, uh, at the blue side band, uh, so um, which means that uh, um, delta is equal to omega. In this case, uh, um, basically I'm uh, I can neglect this a minus, and I find that. Gamma optical minus a plus oops, minus a plus, which is equal to minus, and then uh, this, right? the same expression as on the red side band, only with the minus sign. Okay, uh, and then this this can cause a problem. And this is the next thing that I wanted to discuss uh, uh, using side now. By the way, so is there any question, uh, maybe? Um, okay, if not, then I can proceed. Yeah, so now I wanted to describe what happens when I'm, I'm driving either uh, in the view side band and um, I start to, uh, you have this negative damping uh, on the cavity, so this gamma optical is negative, and basically uh, I can, uh, if I start to have cooperativity, which is larger than one, so this, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, it's different notation, gamma m was the gamma intrinsic before, uh, and basically it is that if I start to have cooperativity equal one, uh, I have this uh, funny situation that uh, suddenly I have a system which does not have any damping anymore. It's either amplified. Uh, so I would have this kind of dynamic. Um, uh, so basically, I, I, um, I start to. Um, uh, so my if I, I start with some fluctuation, but since I have this. Anti damping my my I start to vibrate at the mechanical frequency uh, and uh, it's like an oscillator that instead of being damp is 
uh, amplified and so I have larger and larger oscillation until uh, uh, at some point when the, the oscillation are large enough, the nonlinearities start to set in. So you remember we had at the big, uh, we started with a nonlinear nonlinear equation of motion. When I'm in this regime where uh, the, the oscillations start to become large, I have to consider the full uh, nonlinear equation of motion and I arrive to um, to an amplitude A. So, and I have this set sustainable oscillator. And this is a very um, uh, well known and, and uh, general phenomenon that it's uh, so it's not limited to auto mechanics. Um, so the idea is that when I have a, a, a mechanical system close to an attractor, that's what we are describing. So the, all this linearization business is uh, basically described the small fluctuation of, of, uh, of a nonlinear oscillator close to an attractor. And uh, uh, now we have a scenario that can happen in other situation where I have gain where uh, suddenly, um, and basically, the idea is that I, I have some uh, exponent that describe how I decay to the attractor. Uh, and, um, and basically, there is a general scenario when suddenly uh, this, uh, a pair of these exponents uh, um, become imaginary. Uh, and um, not. Uh, or let's say the, the imaginary part of this exponent, which corresponds in my case to the damping, uh, become negative. Uh, and this is what is called an op bifurcation. So it's really something I, now I, I do not have time to describe the, 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 the details, but the idea is that it's like a very general phenomenon. So it's not limited to auto mechanics. And the typical uh, thing that happens is that there is a threshold, and above this threshold, I start to have self sustained oscillator oscillations, and the oscillation uh, like uh, um, increase uh, as a square as a square root uh, behavior. Um, okay, yeah. So in this case, this of bifurcation in, in the simplest setting is uh, uh, is that delta divided by, by omega equal one. Uh, and I can also like uh, plot the same thing now in a 3D representation. Uh, so I have these limit cycles and the amplitude of the limit cycles depend on, on the driving frequency. So if I, on the driving uh, power, so on the time strength uh, and, uh, but when I'm very close, so I cl very close to the bifurcation, I have this universal behavior like the square root. And what is important, there is nothing that fits the phase, right? So only the amplitude is fixed, uh, but uh, since this oscilla oscillation comes from, from this gain that does not have any phase, I could have any, any arbitrary phase. Okay. Uh, okay, now today I'm going quite fast. So I guess I will uh, probably uh, finish the lecture earlier. Uh, okay, the only thing that I wanted now to talk is um, uh, what happens. In the, so this was very close to the to the transition. Uh, so in this case, you can describe everything in terms of a very general uh, theory, but uh, if you uh, uh, it's also very interesting to consider the uh, the very special case of the optomechanical Hamiltonian, and uh, this has been studied in this uh, uh, very interesting paper from Florian Marquard, uh, Harris, and uh, Stephen Given, Given, Jack Harris and Stephen Given, uh, and uh, so what is represented here is like the motion of the of the mechanical system, so that just display simple sinusoidal oscillation with amplitude a, uh, and then how the cavity, uh, the number of separating photon uh, in the cavity uh, uh, change. So I don't have uh, any more like a constant number of separating photons. Uh, I have this like very fast uh, oscillation, but uh, everything is periodic, uh, and um, so I. Maybe here I can just give a gist of uh, how it's treated. So 
basically you can find this there are actually many attractor uh, when you go away from this uh, uh, from this uh, uh, bifurcation and you can find an attractor by requ requiring that uh, the um, it, so all these attractors are described by some periodic uh, motion and you need basically that the average of the power that uh, that it's made by the radiation pressure uh, that, that that it's produced by the radiation pressure uh, is equal to the uh, to the power that it's dissipated uh, or the ratio is one so this is what is plot yeah so what is dissipated is obviously the mass time the decay rate time that's what's called okay and so uh, in this way they uh, have found some oh, so, uh, uh, to show the different slide that have a different presentation so just one second Yeah, okay, sorry, I don't know it even here. Yeah, that's stupid. Uh, okay, doesn't matter. So I invite you to. Uh, Okay, so somehow I destroyed this beautiful slide that, by the way, was done by Florian. Uh, but um, so it showed the, attract, uh, the, the attractor diagram for the, uh, as has been studied in this paper by Ellison and Kevin. Uh, so you see that there is the, this obfuscation and then many different attractors. Uh, and so these are the experiments that uh, uh, studied uh, experimentally the. Uh, Possible solutions, and uh, yeah, this shows that um, so basically you can uh, there are some, there is some hysteresis. So by changing the driving parameters, you can switch from one attractor to different attractors. Um, okay, so actually this is all the material <laughs> that I have for today. So it was a little bit fast. Uh, is there any question? Well, thank you, Vittorio. Uh, maybe a question about the um, attractors again. So you defined it in terms of, or you said that in the, you can look at the power ratios to find an attractor. But if I want to say if I have the equations of motion, so how what would be the defining features of an attractor? How can I look for an attractor from there? So basically what you do, you assume you are looking for periodic solutions of the equation of motions. And then assuming that the solution is periodic, you find like this kind of conditions uh, for. Uh, uh, that's why you said you need a, a pair of uh, imaginary eigenvalues, basically. No, this is about when you reach the off bifurcation. So this is still uh, about the, the the analysis close to the. So now there are two type of attractor. Now I, uh, the 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 attractor I was talking about now are kind of uh, limit cycles solutions uh, whereas uh, now I, uh, this is for, for the nonlinear dynamics uh, but now there are the simplest attractor where I just have a constant uh, amplitude in the cavity and, and a constant displacement uh, and then uh, for these attractors uh, I uh, some of them can be unstable and there are two ways how, how they are unstable one is because uh, Basically, the the uh, the frequency of the vibration about the attractors goes to zero, and the other way is that, uh, and these are the uh, 
the one that uh, we had discussed at the very beginning. They have this cubic solution with three solution and one was unstable. But then there is the other scenario where instead the decay rate goes to zero. And this I can have for uh, uh, if when, when the optical uh, anti-damping is larger than the optical damping. And uh, this is a condition that depends on the mechanical uh, decay rate. Um, so if I'm at in the blue side band and I, and it, I can always have this, uh, this off bifurcation is, is the mechanical decay is small enough. Uh, okay, and then uh, the idea is that if I'm very close to, to, to the bifurcation, I have this off theory and I can describe this as an off bifurcation. Uh, and I have uh, this square root behavior of the amplitude uh, so uh, this is something very general, but then what uh, Florian and uh, Jack Harris and Steve Gavin described in their paper was happens when I also go very far away from this off bifurcation. And then I have many different solutions uh, and uh, yeah, the, so it's very nice. It's uh, really a pity that I don't have this idea. Yeah, yeah, this very complicated, uh, uh, like, phase space with many solutions and, mm -hmm. and and some of these solutions will then be stable and some unstable is that what you meant by stable and unstable attractors uh, in this or in uh, okay now these solutions are all uh, uh, stable now this was when i was talking about um, about this const this attractor that you find by just solving the equation of, of motion assuming that there is no uh, that there is no uh, time dependence. So this attractor that you have when you have constant uh, number of circulating photon and constant displacement of the mechanical field, uh, except for some small vibration about it. Okay. And then there are, in that case, there are exactly three attractors. And uh, 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 yeah, so one of them is unstable. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have, you can have this bad stability, but you cannot have tri stability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. So basically, this is a much more, it's much more, you have much more because now you're considering very complete any periodic orbit instead of just a constant field. So mm -hmm. you have much more solutions, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, let's have another look if there are any questions. I can't see any on YouTube or in the chat for the moment. Well, well, okay, then so it's we, uh, yeah. Then I suppose it's we can resume tomorrow. Yeah, uh, I can mention what I'm going to discuss tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, uh, so arrays, uh, and so there will be also connection with topology. So how to realize topological dense structures. Uh, in open mechanical systems. That sounds really exciting. Well, we're looking forward to that. Uh, th thank you, Vittorio. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day and see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.